Welcome to another episode of Culinary School Stories, the weekly podcast that is dedicated to sharing the stories of people around the globe whose lives have been influenced, impacted, touched, and or enriched, for good or for bad, from their culinary school experience. Hi, my name is Colin Roach and I'm your host. Thanks for joining us today. You are an important part of this show where we ask the question, what's your culinary school story? So now, without any further delay, let's meet today's guest. Hello, everyone, and thank you once again for listening in to another episode. If you have not yet subscribed, please do so. It is free, and we would love to have you as part of our community. And it's so easy to subscribe. Just click the subscribe button on whatever app you use to listen to the podcast, whether that is Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, etc. And you can also subscribe to our YouTube channel as well, where you can watch videos of the interviews. And by subscribing, you help us out a lot by moving us up in the rankings. So my guest today is an experienced executive chef who has years of experience working in the healthcare side of the industry. He's also a veteran of the U.S. Armed Forces, having spent 12 years in the Army as a combat lifesaver and infantryman. And those are only part of his culinary school story. So now it is my pleasure to welcome Chef Charles Redmond to the show. Charles, thanks for joining us today and sharing your culinary school story. Thank you for having me on, Chef. So first off, I want to thank you for your service. Appreciate that. Thank you. And I believe it was your service in the military that actually brought you to culinary school. Is that true? Maybe you could tell us how that happened. Um, we were part of S-415 uh, Peacekeepers in Sarajevo. And my driver had slammed the brakes and I messed my back up. In the process, um, I applied for VA benefits got them granted, was told by uh, a friend of mine to get my VA voc rehab, they would send me to school. And that was the start of the journey. So you never thought about culinary going to school for that? Your your plan was to be a, a lifelong military person? That was your career? Oh, yeah. I was going to retire, you know, 30 plus years and and then might look at something, but never thought of Going to culinary school. So this injury put an end to that, and now you had to look at something else. And they came up with, you know, the, the, the going back to school. You know, they could help you with that. What did they recommend? Did, did, did culinary jump right to the front of the line, or were you just kind of thinking it through? Did you have other options? Oh no, the, um, my case manager. Um, the big push by them was for me to become an EMT or a paramedic, hmm. and I knew I wasn't interested in that. I had done it. Um, repeatedly and it wasn't something I wanted to do. So we ended up, um, I was going to, um, my first semester was going to be all my general studies and, and all that play stuff, you know, kick those out of the way as much as I could. While, while you're deciding on a kind of a major degree to pursue. Yeah, w- which major I'm going to go for. And we ended up, um, I come out of an English class I'm coming down the hallway and two people walk by me in chef's whites. And it was like, okay, when did we do this? <laughs> and um, they had bulletin boards up in the uh, student lounges. And, you know, this is the new curriculum. This is going to be a new degree program, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yeah, you know, I, I've washed dishes before. Um, I've worked in bars as short order cook. I, had nitpicked back and forth when I was in the military because you made extra money. Mm -hmm. And um, I finally went, yeah, why not do it? I like to eat. (laughs) It brings a smile to people's faces. And I had to fight to get into the program. Uh, My VA rep would not sign off on it. She did not want me to go that way. Now, she wanted you to be an EMT because that's kind of what you were doing in the military. You were the, explain what your job was. I was a um, anti-armor heavy anti-armor infantrymen. Uh, I would go out ahead of everybody. And if there was any tanks or bunkers, we would blow them up. Okay. And you saved people too. You had to do some kind of medic types things. Back in the early eighties, Israel started a a combat lifesaver program. Every one of their soldiers is uh, what they call a uh, angel in that process is basically it goes along the lines of, if we can put two or three lifesavers into a platoon, that means it's one less person the medic has to worry about. Uh, if you get hit, their whole process was 
along the lines of you will fight harder if you know your buddy next to you can patch you up. Mm. And it's true. Um, we went to uh, Katrina and it was right after they had uh, done away with our cooks in our, in our infantry unit. They had, nope, we're not using cooks anymore. Um, I was cooking that day. We decided we were going to do PT that morning and we're setting up the, the football field because we're going to play flag football. And if anybody's ever seen the, the movies of military when they're, they're doing stuff like that, it's not flag football for very long. <laughs> Quickly turns to tackle. <laughs> oh, it turns to a bloodbath. <laughs> but um, the very first play, I hear a snap and I'm, my ears perk up and I hear someone scream my name and I go over and <laughs> I loved him to death. And I'm going, let me see your arm. And he's going, no. No, I'm going, let me see your arm. And he goes, no. And I went, you're either going to let me see it or I'm going to grab it. And he showed me, and it looked like a perfect spoon. Like you take the backside of a spoon. And we are 45 minutes away from the closest hospital. So go in, we set him down, and I'm checking for capillary refill in his fingers. There's none. Uh, I know his real job is a police officer in the world. He's right-handed. Here's this broken right wrist, and I've got a brand new medic that just graduated, looked at me and goes, I don't know what to do. I went, watch this. I take a towel, I wrap it around his wrist, we give him four Tylenols because that's the strongest thing we have. And I look at him and I went, on the count of four, we're going to try to set this. Are you okay with this? And he goes, man, I've got to keep my hand. I went, one, two, and I popped it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and he looked at me and went, what the hell happened to four? <laughs> you didn't want you to know. <laughs> oh, no. We get into the hospital and we're in outside of Biloxi, Mississippi. Wow. Um, our lead mer- medic, um, he's standing there and the doctor calls him over and he goes, man, you did a great job setting these wrists. And he goes, I didn't. He did. And he goes, oh, you're a medic. And he goes, he's not a medic. I've trained him. So they wanted you to stay on that track. They wanted you to pursue EMT. They're like, oh, you already have this knowledge. You already have a basic skill foundation. Go. But you didn't want it. You had enough. You get attached to people. Um, I had seen enough of carnage. Yeah. I had been a volunteer fire dep- fighter. I, I didn't want it. I, w- I want to see people happy. I want to see people smiling. And food definitely does that, right? Brings them joy. Yes, it does. Okay. So – Take me to school now. You're walking down the hall. You see the the sign. How, how did you convince the recruiter or your VA person, the, the benefits person, that this is this is what you want and this is what you need? We, we argued it. We argued it. Um, I went over her head to her supervisor, and I went, my next stop is my congressman's office. Um, I was told to go talk to the department chairman at the time. She sat down, and we came up with the whole plan, mapped everything out. And um, one thing led to another, and my next semester, we were game on. Great. So what happened? So you you got, you got some uniforms, you got some books, tools, you got a schedule. Tell me about that process. Um, we were the only school at, at the time. Our culinary department was in two rented kitchens off campus. So this was Ivy Tech Community College in Indiana, but yes. that, the, it wasn't on the main campus, the culinary part. No, we were using the old um, Career Center's kitchen and the old um, Masonic Temple's kitchen. And you're talking flat tops that were made in 1940s. Um, that was the first classroom I walked into. Um, I showed up. All my stuff was pressed. My shoes were shined. I was shaved. Walked into the room and I still remember to this day, the the chef instructor turns around and she's got grayish blonde hair, might be a hundred pounds if she's lucky and looks at me and goes, why are you here? Because this is where I'm supposed to be. Um, I was one of uh, three guys in the class. The rest were women. It was mostly females? Yes. Wow. Why did she say that to you? Because you were a male or because you were older? What, what, why would she say that? I was 20 minutes early. Oh. Because <laughs> that, that was the thing. Uh, you show up 15 minutes early to the time they tell you to show up. Well, in the military, that's already been adjusted 15 minutes. <laughs> so what was, the t- what was the subject of that class, that first one? 
Uh, that was basic food in theory. Um, Chef Nikki, um, her dad had owned a restaurant. Her dad wanted her brother to go to uh, Le Cordon Bleu in France. He didn't want to have anything to do with it. And she basically threatened to leave home if he didn't send her. And she graduated and just awesome. Great. So that was a good experience for you. How were the other classmates? Was there some other military veterans in there? Or they were all like right out of high school? No, no. I I was in I was in my 30s and the average person was 19, 20, 21 ish. How was that dynamic? Um made you younger or made them older? Or are y'all come in the middle, meet in the middle somewhere? The, the best thing about Nikki's classes was she would show you about the first 45 minutes of, was her, everybody around the table, she was demonstrating. Mm-hmm. Then we would do it, and then we would all sit down and eat together. We would try everybody's because everybody didn't use the same seasoning. Everybody used to, you know, we didn't pan fry the same. We Everybody has a different flair, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And, and she would sit and critique you. Your classmates would critique you. Oh, so great. So now, was this your first experience in in food service, or did you have some experience prior to this? Oh, no. Uh, I had worked as a dishwasher for a local bar. Um, I had done – I'd been a bouncer when I was in the military. Uh, I had jumped on the line to help them cook. I mean, I had even done uh, maintenance at McDonald's at one time to go in and clean machines, fix machines, clean out front, empty garbage cans. I will tell anyone I hire, and even when I was an instructor, I would tell them, I won't ask you to do anything I haven't done or can't do because you lead by example. Right. And being uh, the executive chef, you definitely lead by example. So you started young. I mean, obviously, you had some experience dishwashing and all the way up through, and and now you're in kind of a, another commercial kitchen. So it wasn't brand new like it is for some students in there, but still there was learning going on. There was probably introduction to new cuisines and new, maybe some techniques you hadn't learned before. Did you have a favorite class or was there anything that stood out to you during that training? I had a couple of favorites. Um, I really liked Meat Fab. And the reason why was we rented this kitchen at the Career Center. Uh, they had done away with their their food service program. So the equipment's there, but we only went one night a week to this. So you would have two chickens to break down. You would have this beautiful uh, rack to break down. You can't need it all. Each of us would have this. So you would break it down, get graded. You would fix something, and then you would pack everything up, and you would take it home so you could cook at home which was awesome. So you, you made fabricate some of it there for your dinner, but the rest of it you take home raw and then you can practice again and cook it for the family. Yep. Oh, what a great way. Which was awesome. <laughs> now, did you have academic classes as well? Oh, yes. The rest of the, the, rest of the time? Because you had one night a week there in the lab. So what was the other days like? You had soup stocks and sauces. You had intro to baking. You had advanced baking. You had um, chocolates and candies. It, it ran the gamut, which was awesome. It was never... And it was still one one night a week for each one of those two? Um, international was two nights, and fish and seafood was three, because fish and seafood was only ran during the summer. So it was Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And what were you doing the other days of the... And then the other days of the week, you were taking the academic classes? Yep. Like my nutrition, my math class, surf safe, uh, costing... Did a and when they put it in the, the program, it said menu design. And we told them they need to rebrand it because it's not menu design. It's basically you start with this is what your menu items you want to do, but you had to find out okay, are we going to go brick and mortar? Are we going to do a pop up? Are we going to do a trailer? Uh, what permits do you need? How much is it going to you? When you were done, you gave them a book that was three inches thick. Mm. It's basically your... It was, it was more of a... It's like a business plan. Yeah. <laughs> business plan. Awesome. So then you went on, you got other degrees, right? You went on to get more schooling and, and t- maybe you could talk about how that... Is that later on? That was later on. Um, Where did you go then after school? Well, I had a, a mentor in school, loved him to death. Um, 
Chef David Kane. He did our um, advanced cuisine. We talked and we were talking uh, about ACF. And at the time, we were in the process of the, the school was of putting in to become a certified school. And um, we were talking because he was a CEC. We, we were an hour after class was over drinking coffee. And, and he had told me, he goes, what you need to do is find out what the top certification you can set for and do it. He goes, enough of the BS. He goes, there's no reason to pay for a CC certification when you're a CEC. You hold the experience, you hold. And I was like, yeah, because I'm listening to a couple of others in class. Oh, that's not right. You need to go through everything. And he goes, no, why spend more money than you have to? He goes, you've got a family, you've got kids to take care of, you've got bills. Do it right the first time. Okay. So rather than go for like sous chef or mm-hmm. culinary and go right up to the executive chef because you already had that job experience qualification. I had the experience. Makes sense. Uh, I was just putting the I was putting the education part to the experience, which I needed. I, I realized that once I was in the kitchen learning, going, hey, there's things I don't know. <laughs> um, so true. I applied um, to Walt Disney World's um, college intern program because you had to have an internship before you could graduate. In this time frame, um, it was over Mardi Gras weekend. Uh, Chef Kane passed away. Uh, he was a severe diabetic and had a heart attack. Um, so we're dealing with that. Um, two days later after he passed, I get a phone call setting up my first phone interview. With Disney. With Disney. Uh, it's 35 minutes and I'm like, boy, that was quick. And then we, um, about a week later, I get another, hey, we need to set up another one. Okay. I could tell somebody else was on the line, but they wouldn't speak. Um, then we end up to a third interview, and they're asking questions about meat temperatures, how to store food, uh, how to dress, things that you should know by this time. So I'm waiting for her to, to, to cut it off because every interview so far has been 30, 35 minutes. All of a sudden, she goes, I'm going to turn you over to the chef. Oh, okay. So an hour later, he goes, if you get a small envelope, you didn't make it. If you get a big envelope, you've made it. Have a good day. <laughs> And it's like, wow. And I mean, it was, he was straight cut. No, no bells, whistles. You couldn't read him. Um, So it's three weeks at this time. I am working as the food service director for a local um, park and recreation center. I come home and my wife goes, there's an envelope on the table for you. Is it big? Is it little? (laughs) I walk in and it's this big purple envelope. You open it up and it's congratulations. You've been accepted. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, great. Uh, Long story short. I packed up everything and drove straight through. Most people don't realize you get down there, you've got a reporting time and date. You can't drive on the property until that time. And then you start and it's um, it's like trying to drink through a fire hose, all the information they're, they're shoving at you. But you do an FBI background check is your second station. And we were losing people left and right. (laughs) <laughs> and it's like, okay. And at the time they had three um, apartment complexes that they would put students at. And when you filled out your papers, it was okay. I'm okay. You know, having roommates that, you know, are teenagers or six to a, a suite and, and stuff like that. Right. Right. They try to match people up. I find my apartment. I'm carrying stuff in the guy coming up the stairs on the other side is carrying his stuff in and we're roommates. There's two of us. That's it. We're both ex-military. The very first night, we run to the Walmart. We get cleaning supplies, adult beverages, food. Um, we get bored because we've cleaned. We've already got our ID cards, so we head off to Epcot. I'm standing in front of the Oriental Pagoda, and my wife calls me. It's pouring down rain because there's a hurricane coming in. We're watching the fireworks show. And she goes, what are you doing? And I went, I'm standing in Japan drinking a Guinness. And she goes, you're at Epcot. <laughs> yep. But the, the the adventure there was exactly that. It was an adventure. And that was the internship for the school to fulfill your degree requirements. Yep. And, that, and then after that, you, did you stay on or did you go on to another job? Uh, I had to come back home and take two more classes. But while I was down there, I went and took my uh, certified executive chef's test. Oh, while you were in Orlando? Yes. Oh, tell us about that, because I know you you had a couple of mishaps along the way. Oh, <laughs> um, it's two hours away. 
you you have to purchase everything. You take all your pots, pans, dishes, everything when you show up. It's two hours away from Orlando where you were going to do it. Yes. Wow. Where was that? Oh, God. Daytona, Jacksonville. I can't even remember. It was some little... It was a technical school in Florida. Though. Uh, chef um, Jeffrey Rotes from uh, Chefs Helping Chefs. He's the he was the facilitator for it. I walk in and there's four of us testing that day. I get everything set up and I get assigned a student to to take my dishes away and wash them and all of us do. And we're not even five minutes into this exam and they're sending one of the kids home. He had messed up on sanitation. Boop, you're done. Boop, you're gone. We end up um, three of us. Make it to our time frames. I had practiced. I had practiced. Oh my God. I don't know how many times. That's good. They usually recommend you practice, what, 10 times before you take the certification? <laughs> oh, it was more than that. Um, my, my roommate was dating a young lady that was uh, the little pixie from Disney. Oh, yeah. Tinkerbell or one of them. <laughs> yeah, Tinkerbell. But she was complaining that she couldn't fit in her outfit because I was making her fat. Oh, cooking too much, sampling. Oh, yeah. I mean, we would do breakfast every Saturday morning. Our our apartment door was open and you'd have Chippendale and Buzz Lightyear and the Evil Queen. They were all in our apartment at one time or another. <laughs> How fun. Which was great. But um, you go in and the, the whole time I am there, I've got one judge that is just glaring. And he's got his glasses pulled down to the tip of his nose, and he's looking over the top of them. And the whole time, he doesn't look down at the clipboard. He's just writing, and it's like, oh, my God, am I jacked up that bad? You know, I'm, I'm making sure I don't lean against anything. I, I'm washing my hands after everything I do. But we end up uh, going in because you get your critique. And uh, he goes, I hate to tell you, you didn't pass. You missed it by a couple points. And I take out my notepad and they go, what are you doing? And I went, I need to know where I messed up. So they give me my critique. I write it out. I go back. We plan that I'm going to come back the next week. On the way back, I lose my transmission halfway there. So it's another week. And I'm devastated. Um, We rent a car. I have to go get the food again. We go and I walk in. And uh, when it's all said and done, and they went, congratulations, chef, you passed. Oh, great. And I take out my notepad and I went, okay, I want my critique. And one of them goes, no, you passed. And I went, no, I want my critique. I can't get better because I know I made mistakes. And it was ear to ear grins at the table going, that's what we need. <laughs> awesome. So you first time failed, came back the week later, but on the way, lost your transmission, had to cancel it, yep. rent a car, come back another week later, buy all new food. <laughs> <laughs> and then you passed. Yes. <laughs> Perseverance. That's great. So then you go back to school to finish your two classes. You got your CEC in the meantime while you're on your internship. You take your two classes. Where would your career go from there? What 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 path were you taking? I ended up at the country club, but my uh, grandfather had been food service manager. And no one realized that there was even a plaque on the wall about him until I pointed it out one day and they went, Oh, so so it was like, okay, family-wise, we had came full circle. I know he was never trained. He he fell into it via the Army because he was an Army cook during World War II. So that might be some of in my genes, so to say. Yeah. (laughs) Okay, I'm going to take a quick pause right now and ask you, the listener of this episode, to sign up for our newsletter and mailing list. I left a link in the description, or it may be even easier just to go to www.chefroach.com slash contact. That's chefroach, all one word, dot com slash contact. Then just go to the bottom of the page and sign up for our newsletter. It's free. Then once you're signed up, you'll never miss out on our latest news, announcements, episodes, contests, course information, or exclusive deals. So go ahead, sign up so you can get all the information and more through the periodic email updates. And don't worry, you can always unsubscribe if you don't like it. The link again is www.chefroach.com slash contact. So go ahead, do it now. We want you to be part of our community. And if you don't do it now, you'll probably just forget by the time this episode is over. 
So just hit the pause button right now and take the 15 to 20 seconds to get it done and then come back and hit play. We'll wait for you, I promise. Okay, hopefully you just did it or you've already done it in the past or at the very least, you'll be doing it very soon. Your support of the show and the network is very important to us and we thank you in advance. Alrighty, so now back to the show. So you took over as the executive chef there where your grandfather was the food service director probably yep. 30 years before. I hadn't even graduated uh. yet. Um, we were doing a Friday night dinner. I switched chef's coats, went and graduated with a clean chef's coat underneath my graduation gown. <laughs> Work, run to graduation, go back. Oh, no, I didn't go back. <laughs> I had the rest of the night off. But. Well, that's good. So then how did you get into the healthcare? Because that's where you're now. And it seems like you had that journey that took you into, you know, more of that uh, healthcare end of the industry for food service. Well, I had, I had left the country club to go teach at a brand new culinary program. Um, the problem was it was two and a half hours drive one way. Mm. And it wasn't bad. I, I loved it. I loved the kids. But when gas got to, to four bucks a gallon, it was like, I can't do this. Um in that process, I was doing catering and Indeed was just coming online. And they had an opening um, outside of Indianapolis for an executive chef for a hospital. I went, yeah, well, I'll apply because it had benefits. Uh, went down and interviewed. Didn't think the interview was any good at all because uh, the department head was a uh, registered dietitian. She didn't want the she didn't like the idea of a chef being in her kitchen. Um, the hospital president was pushing it. So get in and we ended up being good friends. But what they felt to tell me was they had only budgeted it for one year. What were they going to do the other years? They didn't put it back in the budget. So I left there and uh, ended up at a um, retirement community, which was a hybrid. And all the, all the while you're doing catering at, as well. You have oh, your yeah. veterans. What's the name of your business? You're still running that now? Uh, veterans Catering. Veterans Catering. Good, good. So you're still doing that. But as the peaks and valleys of the business cycle, you, you had a full-time job as well. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, we were a hybrid out of all the, the company's facilities. We had long-term care. We had assisted living. We had independent living. And we had rehab all under one roof. So I had the gamut of what diets were going to need to be. We had from feeding tube to puree to, you know, I've got one that the only thing they wanted to eat was hot dogs. You're paying to be here. I can't argue the fact as long as you're eating. Yeah. And then I ended up uh, leaving there for another hospital and thought about walking away from the industry because I was basically burned out. Wow. Um, I had... I was working as a industrial firefighter. I had seen the ads pop up on Indeed for the position at Sela House and um, went, eh, yeah, no. And it was a Sunday night. We went to church and the whole time we we're in church, it felt like somebody was flipping me in the back of the head going, hey, remember that job? Remember that job? I applied that Sunday night, Tuesday, while I was on shift, I get a phone call and <laughs> Me and the uh, executive director for clinicals played phone tag for three days. We arranged an interview. I told her, I'm going to be coming from work. I'm going to be in a fire uniform. It'll probably be filthy. She goes, I don't care. Um, knocked on the back door. The nurse answers the door and goes, oh, okay, shuts it, goes upstairs and goes, the fire department's here. <laughs> well, she knew about it. No one else in the building did. So we, we had almost a two-hour interview, and then we walked around downstairs, and uh, they that was a Wednesday and Friday. I put in my notice for where I was at, and two weeks later, I started. Oh, great. And yes, we are, you're currently now there as well, right? Yes. And what does that facility do there? What kind of food do you prepare, and what are, the, what are the customers, the clients like? We have two buildings. We have an adult facility, um, and then we have a teen facility. It's for women. We deal with everything from... Um, you name it, eat, eating disorder wise, um, where they basically starve yourself, bulimia. Uh, we have, um, we've dealt with ARF, ARFIN, where they think all food is deadly. Mm. We have texture issues. Um, last night, we have a 
a regular main dish, and then we have a vegetarian dish of the same item. So I had those two dishes, but I had nine different variations off of those two dishes. Yeah, how do you do that? I mean, do they put in their order? And adv- I mean, what do they? How do you know what to make? Uh, they put out a weekly menu, and then they say, "I like this, but with no texture. I'd like this one more liquid." Or they set and filter menus out with their dietitian, so the dietitians push them at certain points. Uh, it's a rotating four week menu. We do breakfast, lunch, dinner, and then we at ten three and eight, they get snacks. And then in between that, they may even get a shake that we make, which is high calorie. Here we go. Let's get these calories back where you need to be. But right now um, I've dealt with one that's uh, dairy free and gluten free and trying to find items that fit that is almost impossible, but it can be done. So this is really where your career has taken you into this healthcare and the different parts. You've worked in, a, in quite a few facilities now like that. So oh, yeah. you're kind of an expert in that area. Did you, they, they give you training in that aspect? If someone's listening and maybe wants to go into that part of the industry, what would you advise them or what would you tell them to do or to start? You, you, you need to understand your surf safe, definitely, because we deal with all kinds of allergies. Uh, allergic to red dye, allergic to peanuts. Um, we had one lady that was allergic to pecans. Well, our protocol is once you say a nut, you get no nuts whatsoever. If it's got nuts in it, you don't get it. Mm-hmm. Um, like gluten. Nope, you're gluten free. And then they will try to wean it off. But it's us, it's the dietitian, and it's the medical team making sure that we don't cause a reaction. Mm. Um, nutrition class is a big one. A lot of places have uh, intern opportunities. If this is what you were thinking, try it because it's not for everybody. I, I've had people come in, oh, I've been in the industry 10 years and I can do this. And within a week, they quit. It's just they can't deal with the, the menus and stuff and the, the different cuisine or than what they used to? Or Well, they, they expect to come in and it be like McDonald's. Okay, everybody gets the same thing. <laughs> And that's not how it works. Not even close. Very customized. Oh, yeah. So let's go back to culinary school. Now, looking back with being an instructor, being an you know, executive chef multiple places, owning your own business, being an entrepreneur, was culinary school worth it? Was it needed? Uh, was there anything you would change about it? Was there anything missing from it? It was definitely needed. Um, the certification I got has opened up so many doors. Uh, without that, I wouldn't have even been looked at. Uh, would I change it? Yes and no. I would have went to culinary school back in the 80s when I was graduating high school. My dad goes, well, you're going to go in the military or you're going to go to, to school. And at the time, we were looking at me going to uh, Lincoln Tech to work on cars. And I went to him and I went, no, nah, I'm going to go to the military. But you didn't have culinary recruiters coming to schools and talking to kids. Mm-hmm. And at the and also, at the time, you had Johnson & Wells and you had the CIA. Those were the only two that I knew of, but I wasn't going that direction. I would have probably went that direction. Mm. Is there any class that you wish you had that you didn't have when you were in school? Is there something like now looking back, like, wow, I wish they had a this subject was offered? I personally took an accounting class because you need to know how your books are. Mm-hmm. Um, By being a disabled veteran, I signed up for a program called EBV, which is Entrepreneurial Boot Camp for Veterans with Disabilities. I got accepted, and um, it's a crash course on entrepreneurship. Where was that offered? Uh, That was through Cornell. Cornell. Cornell University. Um, You did all this online stuff, and then you flew out there for nine days. And earlier when I said um, getting information from a, a fire hose, that program was it. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, they just hammered you the whole time, but it was awesome. We ate at a different restaurant every night. Um, their culinary students fed us lunch at the hotel. We had breakfast. I mean, it was just this, here you guys go. And it was just awesome. Well, they're known for their, you know, their hospitality school. And so you, you found the curriculum or the material very valuable to help you, what, to start your business or to go into it from a uh, management point of view? Oh, yeah, you because um, you're doing a, a business plan and you have to present it. And when it's all said and done, the EBV found foundation itself, if they've approved it, they will send you anywhere between a thousand and five thousand dollar check to, to help you. And it was like, this is awesome. Wow. 
And you were using that to start your your business, your catering company? Yeah. Oh, great. So very helpful. So now let me ask you, did you have any mentors growing up? Are you a mentor to someone? What do you think about mentorship overall? Uh, mentorship's really important. Um, like I said earlier, I had uh, Chef Kane. I had Nikki. Um, I remember uh, both of my grandparents. Um, my dad's father ran the Elks. My grandmother, my mom's mom, used to work at a donut shop. You know, I remember going in and, you know, here I am seven, eight years old and I'm behind the counter. I can go back and, and, and help the, the guy do the, the donuts. And, and it's those experiences that, you know, hey, don't don't beat the dough. You, you do that and it's, it's no good. Um, I signed up for ACS mentorship program to be a mentor. Mm-hmm. And the reason behind that is uh, I have found that with interns, when we would have them at the museum, they would come in and just, here you go. Uh, my very first intern came in and he's standing in the lobby. And you've, you've got to imagine this huge lobby at a museum. This is where you were, you were working. You were the chef at the museum and, they, and you hired interns. Yes. Okay. Uh, everything echoes. I come out and I hear, oh, shit. And this is from him. He's got a baseball cap on backwards. He's got a tank top. He's got shorts and he's got flip flops. And he's going, chef, I, I, I need an answer. And I went, Nathan, if you're going to talk to me, stand up straight and look me in the eye. Oh, he didn't know. He knew you, but he didn't know you were the person he was going to see. He didn't know I was there. <laughs> so then when he saw you, he went, uh-oh, I know I'm going to be in trouble. Well, he had been the dishwasher at the ACF test the Friday before. Uh, and he's seen how we hammered these people for not being on time, dirty uniforms. And he's like, whoa. And here I come out and I'm wearing all black that day because we were cleaning. And my boss argued the fact with me. Are you really sure? He's really timid. And I went, yeah, but he's teachable. He wants to learn. And we got him in the kitchen and he he thrived. And I come in one morning and outside places could rent rooms. And the chef from one of the local businesses came in and went, hey, do you know this kid? I went, yeah, he works for me. He goes, well. I've tried to call him a couple of times and I get this on the phone of, ha, 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 this is so-and-so, <laughs> I might call you back. That was his voicemail. <laughs> so at seven o'clock in the morning, he comes through the door just to all be in his normal self, all chipper and everything. And I went, we need to talk. And he went, what chef? And I went, two things. At noon, you have an interview. And he goes, no, I don't. And I went, yes, you do. The second thing, change your damn message on your phone. It's not professional. (laughs) Um, They offered him a full-time job, which had benefits. And he goes, I don't want to go. And I went, it's time for you to go. You need to go someplace else, learn some other skills. I always joke around, I train my replacements. And that's what we should be doing. Yeah, I agree. So are you a mentor to a lot of others that come in or just the interns that come in? Or, you know, now that you're with the ACF uh, mentorship, have you had people reach out through that? I, I, I put my... Lack of a better word, feather in the in in the basket. Uh, someone wants to pick it, go for it. You know, they can call me, they can email me. I have no problem. It might be a day before I get back, depending on what my schedule is. But I'll gladly talk to almost anyone. What if someone's listening and they want to they want to they, they want to reach out to you? Can they? And and how would they do that? Oh yeah, it would be my email, Chef Charles Redman at yahoo.com. Okay, so if anyone's listening and is looking for maybe a little advice or wants to, you know, reach out to you just to ask something that you've already shared and ask more about that, then that's how they would do that. And I will put that in the show notes too, so someone can, uh, you know, use it as a link that way as well. So what's next for you then? So where do you where do you see yourself going now? What do you what do you what is your next plan? The next year, five years? If you would have asked me that before COVID. Um, I would have said a food trailer, but with everything going on right now and um, the restrictions my state has put and everybody that's closing, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I just know I'm going to keep getting uh, more education. Get uh, I'm getting ready to set for my CCA. I've also looked into uh, the World Chefs certifications. The, the more documented certifications you have and experience, the better you are at selling yourself. Okay. 
So as we come to the end of our chat today, before we wrap up, is there any last minute advice or guidance that you could give to the listeners or if someone asked you, you know, for advice to going into this industry or going to culinary school, what would you tell them? First thing you need to do is look at the reason why you want to do this. Uh, you've got to have a presence. You've got to have, um, lack of a better word, a flair for it. Yeah, just because you're posting stuff on Instagram doesn't make you the next top chef. Um, never undersell your skills. You went to learn skills for a reason. Remember your basics. Your basic skills will save you every time. You know, it's like making a holiday sauce when it breaks. How do you recover it? Well, here's how you do it. That basic knowledge will save you every time. And uh, I would say, lastly, take care of yourself. You read all the time of chefs uh, committing suicide or have drug issues or alcohol issues. Um, Don't go down that rabbit hole. Take care of yourself. Do you still see a lot of those um, plagues of the industry out there still? Um, Alcoholism, divorce, suicides, you know, things along those lines? Uh, I've been reading about them hit and miss. Here lately, what I, I'm seeing is uh, younger chefs having heart attacks and dying because they're stressing themselves out. You know, oh, it's a perfect plate. You're never going to be perfect. If you're perfect, we have an issue. You, you need to, to be able to put a consistent product out, timely fashion, and every plate, yes, looks like the last one. We're only as good as the last plate we served. We're just feeding people. It's not life or death. <laughs> <laughs> it's just food. <laughs> Well, that is just about all the time we have for this episode, and I want to first thank you, Charles, for coming on the show today and sharing your culinary school story with all of us. We really appreciate your time and your insight and your honesty. Thank you for having me on, Chef. Okay, now, talk soon. Bye-bye. Got it. I appreciate it. Bye. And a big thanks and appreciation also goes out to all of you, the listeners. We hope you enjoy the show and this episode. You all are a big part of this show, so please let us know what you think. Your comments are always welcome, and they help us in making the best show possible. You can email them to culinaryschoolstories at gmail.com. That's culinaryschoolstories at gmail.com. Or even leave us a voicemail at area code 207-835-1275. That's area code 207-835-1275. And if you like the show, we have a big ask of all of you, and that is to share the podcast with everyone you know and to give us a positive rating and review on Apple Podcasts. Okay, until our next Culinary School Story, take care and be well. Bye-bye. Culinary School Stories is a proud member of the Food Media Network.